Savior Jesus, we just praise you, Lord, and thank you for this beautiful, beautiful day that you've given us. We thank you for this Easter season that we're entering into, and we thank you, Lord, that we have an opportunity to turn our hearts and our minds um, to this wonderful, wonderful time of year. Great celebration for the church. And I thank you, Lord, that I have a wonderful church family to share this with, to celebrate with this morning. I thank you for every person that's here. I thank you for those that are joining us online this morning, or perhaps even those that are listening to this later several days from now. Father, we're praying the same for everyone, that we are nourished and fed well on the good word of God, but more than anything else, that you're glorified, that you are lifted up and exalted in our hearts and in our lives. So be lifted up in all that we do this morning. Again, we ask all of this in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. 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 Give it a moment for another word. We will start eating at 9. 
We have to be wrapped up and in here ready to worship together at 10. We're kind of on a tight timeline there. Um, as soon as service is over, the kids will be doing, Lord willing, we'll have no rain. The kids will be doing the Easter egg hunt on both sides of the church probably. But we'll, uh, don't forget to bring a little bag or basket for your kids to pick up eggs. We'll have, we might have a few trash bags or Walmart bags or whatever here. If they want to bring a little basket, that's, that's fine. Uh, the other thing I, I need to mention Parking. And even this morning, our parking lot is completely full. So next week when you come in, if you can uh, park a little closer, maybe as best you can. I know sometimes we have enough parking here that we're all free to, you know, you can open both doors and not even touch each other, and that's fine. But for next week, we need to scrunch in a little bit more. Um, I know Brandon Hawkins to squeeze in. They're okay, but if you have to, like, climb out the window or just open the door, give it a good They're all right with that. So uh, feel free to park as close to them as you like. Amen. All right. I think, what can you have last? That may be all of the, yeah, that's all the announcements we have. Stay with me if you would. Well, Father, I am convinced this morning that you have a message for your church. And what we're about to do right now prepares our hearts for that message. And I'm asking this morning that you would just do a good work through this music, through the songs that we sing. Um, Lord, may they be more than songs. May they really be words of worship, adoration to our King. And Lord, as we move into a very solemn week, this Passion Week, as some refer to it, as we move towards this Good Friday the cross, I just pray that every song we sing this morning would just point us to the, the suffering servant, the sacrifice that was made, the death of our Lord that, that paid our debt for sin. So Father, turn our eyes to the cross this morning and everything we do and again be glorified in it. We ask this again in Jesus' name.
things as we were going through worship, it just kept dawning on me that uh, Chad has not seen my notes this morning. They haven't even really talked about this morning's message other than talking about the cross and some of that stuff. But uh, nearly every song he sang and almost everything he prayed was right in line with this morning's message. And I'm always amazed how God can just bring all that together. So, um, hey, before she gets out of here, everybody say hi to Bailey Hardman. Hi, Bailey. She's got two beautiful little girls with her this morning. Trey is not able to be with us. He's doing ministry back in his own church, but Trey and Bailey served with our youth ministers for a while. We appreciate them. Always glad that they can be back. Chris, would you mind shutting that door for me? Thank you so much. Grab your Bibles this morning and turn to the Old Testament book of Isaiah. We're going to be picking up this morning at Isaiah chapter 52, and we're going to start with verse 13. But we're going to, it's going to be a few minutes before we get there. Today is what we call Palm Sunday. It is that Sunday before Easter. And many churches all around the world are probably talking about um, our Lord's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Where he comes riding in on the bow of a donkey. And people are laying down palm branches. Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes to the name of the Lord. We have... Um, we have focused on that part of the Easter story in years past. You know, the, the neat thing about Easter is you can take it from so many different angles. And there's so much. The depth and the theology of this season is, is deep and great. So there's a lot of different ways we can look at it. And I think we need to try to explore it from every angle possible. Um, this year I want to do something a little different. Something that I've never done. This year we are going to allow the Apostles' Creed to be our guide, and I want to talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. I'll explain what I'm talking about if you're not familiar with the Apostles' Creed. But something else that's a little different this year, we typically spend a few weeks at Easter. Um, I always have an Easter series. I take a break from whatever we're doing to focus on Easter. And we always look at the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's why Easter's all about. We're saying about it this morning. We want to talk about his sacrificial death. We talk about the cross. Then we talk about the empty tomb uh, and the significance of that. I want to focus on two things we don't talk as much about. I want to go back before the death on the cross. And we're going to consider his suffering. Because Jesus didn't just die. He suffered before he died. So we're going to look at the suffering of Christ. And then on the back end, of course, we're going to deal with his death. His burial, his resurrection, but there's another piece that we hardly ever talk about, his ascension. So we're going to spend this week talking about the suffering of Christ. Next week on Easter, we're going to deal with his death and resurrection. The following week, the week after Easter, we're going to continue to celebrate Easter, and we're going to talk about his glorious ascension. There's a lot to be said about the ascension that we really don't hardly ever talk about. So it's going to be a little bit different here than what we've done in the past. Let me introduce you this morning to the Apostles' Creed. Raise your hand if you are familiar at all with the Apostles' Creed. Good. Several of you are kind of familiar with it. Several songs have been written about it. Uh, Third Day has a song titled The Creed, a very popular song. Creed is, a creed is just a a statement of faith. It's kind of, here's the things that we believe. Matter of fact, the word creed is taken from the Latin word credo, and it means, I believe. Okay? So a creed just says, here are the things I believe. The Apostles' Creed has been around, they think it has its origin somewhere around the third century. The Apostles did not write this. But long about the third century, there's a lot of heresy creeping into the church so the church at that time developed kind of a basic statement. If you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Christ, if you are part of the Catholic Church, wait a minute, not Roman Catholic Church as we know it today. Catholic means universal. So if you are part of a worldwide universal church, they, back then they referred to it as the Catholic Church, here is the basic beliefs of that system. Here's what every Christian should acknowledge and believe. This Apostles' Creed has been used in churches for centuries. Some of you may have grew up in creedal churches. Let me read the creed for you. It's not that long. I think there's 12 statements of faith here. 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, descended into hell, on the third day rose again from the dead, ascended to heaven, sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, universal, the communion of saints, the remission of sins, the resurrection of the flesh, and eternal life. Amen. Now some of you may have been raised in churches where creeds, maybe the Apostles' Creed was recited, maybe you were required to um, memorize it. I was not. I have to admit this, I didn't even know the creeds existed until I got into my note years. I don't ever remember our churches talking about any of the creeds of the church. And there's been several of them. The Apostles' Creed is just probably, I would say, maybe the most popular, the most quoted. The Apostles' Creed has served for centuries, it served the church. And if someone were to come along and say, hey, I've heard about you uh, weird Christian folk. What exactly do you believe? Most of us would not take our Bibles, go all the way back to Genesis 1-1 and say, well, let me explain this to you. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We wouldn't start there. We wouldn't try to read them through the scriptures. Instead, the Apostles' Creed gives you kind of a brief summary of what we believe. Now, it does not contain all of the fundamentals of the faith. And there's even a couple of statements in there that are really not what I would call fundamental. For instance, the he descended into hell. That was under great question. We'll talk about that more at another time. At some point, I do want to walk through the entirety of the creed together. Uh, do a whole series on it because I do think we need to be more creedal in our faith. I really do believe there's a lot of advantage to that. I think it's good to bring our kids up in this. Matter of fact, I came across a book just this morning uh, that involved teaching the Apostles' Creed to our children. I think that would be a great curriculum to teach your kids. Have them memorize it. But for the sake of time in this study, we're going to focus on the first half of the creed these next three weeks. We're going to allow the Apostles' Creed to kind of be our outline for our Easter 2023 series, a series that I've titled I believe. So, I want to move rather quickly through the first few statements of this creed that we just read, because I want to get to Easter. So, I want to move pretty fast through these pre-Easter statements. The Apostles' Creed will begins with, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I can't read that without hearing third day in my mind. You know? I believe in God the Father. I can't say it. It's a great song. I love it. It's one of my favorite songs. Show me to do that again. Anyway, I used to tell people, I used to tell my kids in youth group, I was in youth for eight years, and I used to tell the kids, hey guys, open your Bibles to Genesis 1-1, and they would do it if they had their Bibles there. And they'd open their Bibles, and I'd say, we're just going to read the first five words of the Bible. In the beginning, God created. If you can't buy that, close the Bible and go on. Because everything is built on that statement. If you can't acknowledge that God is eternal, he wasn't created, he's been around from the beginning, he actually created the beginning as we know it. He is almighty God, he has always existed, he created time, he created everything. If you can't get your head wrapped around that, you're going to waste your time and the rest of it. It is a fundamental truth of the Christian faith that we believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth and all that is in it. Now, the next statement is equally important. We also believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. Orthodox Jewish faith, they absolutely believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jews will agree with almost everything we believe in in the Old Testament right up to Jesus. And here's where they miss it. They deny that God has a Son. They deny that Jesus is the Messiah. They deny that Christ is the only begotten Son of God. And the Apostle John makes it very clear in 1 John chapter 2, verse 23. No one who denies the Son has the Father. So I don't care what faith group you're part of, if you acknowledge God the Father, 
But if you deny the Son, you deny them both. That's what Jesus said, and that's what his apostles taught. You can say you believe in God all you want to, but if you deny Christ, you deny the Father. Now, what is it we believe specifically about Christ? The next statement says, we believe he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was born of the Virgin Mary. I'm really resisting diving into each one of these statements and going along because I, I just don't have the time to do it. But this statement is so important because the service reminds us that Jesus was completely divine and completely human. He had two natures, a human nature and a divine nature. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, but he was born of the Virgin Mary. Mary was not divine. Contrary to what the Roman Catholic Church will say, she was not divine, not in any way, shape, or form. She was completely human, therefore she gave birth to a human son named Jesus. He was completely divine, and yet completely human. This statement is also what we focus on at Christmas time. We focus on little baby Jesus, born in the manger, right? Conceived the Virgin Mary, and we should. And you've heard me say many times that when we celebrate Christmas, I... I don't want to judge anybody out there that's listening to this really, but I don't understand why anybody doesn't want to celebrate Christmas. There are faith groups, groups of, we'll call them Christians in some group, that just absolutely refuse to celebrate Christmas. I don't get that. Christmas is the first stage of Easter. You'd have no Easter if you didn't have Christmas. I get not celebrating all the gifts and all the you know Christmas trees and all that stuff. I get if you have a problem with that. But come on. Is it not a big deal that God took on flesh and dwelt among us and became an ain't well? It's a big deal. We should celebrate it. It's a joyous time. So we've worked our way through those early statements. Now we come to the focus of today's message. This next statement says, I believe he suffered under Pontius Pilate. In preparation for this study, just like I do just about any study, I try to gather as much material as I can and read and study as much as I can in preparation. And I've been reading a book recently by Albert Moeller. It's been in my library probably for two or three years. I actually got it at the pastor's conference I went to several years ago. Never read it. I pulled it off the shelf a few weeks ago. And it's titled The Apostles' Creed. I recommend that book to you. It's an easy read, not very thick. It's in layman's terms. It's a wonderful book. But in this book, Albert Moeller said, says, Christians sometimes forget that Jesus did not merely die. He suffered before he died. How much do we really meditate on the suffering of Christ? You know, back in 2004, Mel Gibson produced a very controversial movie. So if you know the one I'm talking about, it's called The Passion of Christ. I think he's coming out with another one. To be honest with you, I think I seen that somewhere the other day. I may be wrong. Don't take that to bank, but I think he's producing a, a sequel to that. But years ago, he came out with a movie called The Passion of the Christ, and there was a lot of people that took issue with it. Albert Moeller actually said that in the early viewing of that movie, and he had different feelings about it. Some people felt like it wasn't a movie that Hollywood should have been making, and then you got Mel Gibson, and he, you know, a lot of questions. There was, I watched the movie. And whether you like the movie, whether you dislike, agree, or disagree with the movie, I'm going to tell you one thing that movie accomplished for me. One thing I think that movie did well. It captured the suffering of Jesus. And it was years ago when we watched that movie. And I've watched bits and pieces of it, of it since then, but I haven't watched it all the way through from beginning to end that I will remember. The very first time I watched that movie, the scene that stuck with me so much was the scene where the actor portraying Jesus, they, they tied him to this big wooden post, and his back is bare, and there's a Roman soldier on each side, and they have what looks like bamboo sticks, and they whack him, and then the other one whacks him, they take turns back and forth, whack, 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 and it seems like that scene went on forever. And the thing that really stuck out in my mind in that scene was it just kept going and going and going. And then there was even a point where the Roman soldiers put their hands on their knees and they're breathing heavy and sweat's dripping off of them. They were literally exhausted 
after the beating they were giving to Christ. And I remember watching that, and I'm not real squirmish. I mean, I like I like war movies, right? I mean, I'm into all that. I'm okay with it. But watching that, that one tore me up. And I remember sitting there watching that thinking, can we please move on? We did it. He was beat terrible. But they just kept out. And then as that wasn't bad enough, they stepped back with a great big whip. They called it the cat of nine tails. There was a big leather whip that had bone and glass and all this stuff woven into the whip. And they'd throw that thing and stick it into his back and then they would rip it out. And they showed that over and over and over. And I got to the point where I was almost sick. I was like, oh my goodness, can we please just move on? And you know, I'm not so sure that we don't seem to do that. We don't want to think about the suffering of Christ. Sometimes we just want to, hey, let's just move on to the resurrection, right? Woo, that's the victorious, wonderful moment. And it is. But folks, Scripture brings us back to the suffering of Jesus a lot. It's something God the Father wants us to know. It wasn't like Jesus lived three and a half years with his disciples and then one day said, hey, I'm going to do this for you, and then he just laid down and died. He suffered terribly. And one of the passages that amazes me about the suffering of Jesus is right here in Isaiah chapter 52. But before we read it, I want to say this. Here's what really blows my mind. This prophecy that God spoke to Isaiah the prophet, that he wrote into words, he penned 700 years before Jesus was conceived by the Virgin Mary, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. 700 years before his incarnation, Isaiah wrote these words. I want to read the prophecy in its entirety, so I want to pick up in verse 13, and we're actually going to read through the end of chapter 53. I'm reading out of the NIV. It says, See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they are not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty, majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and he bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? He was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offspring, offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great. He will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sins of many and made intercession 
for the transgressors. I want to point, in the time we have left this morning, I want to point to just a few prophecies that are fulfilled here. There's several, but for the sake of time, we're going to only focus on a few. By the way, this passage we just read was quoted numerous times in the New Testament. Jesus himself quoted at least a couple of these passages. The apostles quoted it several times. This morning, I'm going to quickly show you a promise. I want to show you his mission. I want to show you his innocence. And I want to go back to chapter 52, if you would, and turn to verse 13 of chapter 52. And I want to reread that passage for you, but I want to read it out of the New American Standard Bible. It translates that passage a little differently, and I think more accurately. It says, Behold, my servant will prosper. <coughs> The entire mission of the suffering servant, and by the way, God does not reveal to Isaiah that this is the very Son of God. He calls him a suffering servant that is to come. We get that as we get into the New Testament. God reveals that this servant is actually his own son. But here he calls him a suffering servant. He says, my servant is going to, is going to prosper. The entire mission of the servant that was to come begins with a promise straight from God. And you know what the promise is? This is going to work. My servant is going to prosper. This plan is going to accomplish everything it intends to accomplish. Nothing's going to stop this plan. My servant's coming. He's going to accomplish exactly what I want him to accomplish. What is that? When well, we move on to his mission. Look at verse 4 through 6 of Isaiah 53. Surely he took up our pain and he bore our suffering. But we considered him punished, stricken by him, afflicted. He was pierced. For our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds were healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You should really underline verses 4 through 6 in your Bible. If you're an underliner, it should be highlighted. And I'm going to tell you why. This is the mission of our Lord, this is why he came. And you need to take notice of the wording there. Did you notice it's our pain, our suffering, our transgressions, our iniquities, his wounds equal our healing, his punishment equals our peace. The point here is that Jesus suffered a terrible death so that we don't have to suffer an eternal death. He took it all and he didn't deserve it. He didn't deserve any of this. And by the way, Jesus didn't just suffer a little bit of pain. I don't jump it back and forth, but go back again to chapter 52, verse 14. I don't want you to miss this. What's it like he suffered a little bit, you know, maybe an hour or two, he endured and then he died. Listen to what Isaiah prophesies. They came to pass as many as many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance. His form beyond that of the children of mankind. If I could paraphrase that, they beat him so bad he didn't even look human anymore. Every Christmas, we celebrate this cute cuddly little baby Jesus in the manger. We should. We celebrate this wonderful time of year where Jesus steps into our world and he brings eternal life. But let us not forget, folks, he didn't just come and bring life. He came and he suffered and he died so we have eternal life. Our Mueller actually says the joy of Christmas occurs only with the scandal of the cross. If it weren't for the suffering of the cross, Christmas would just be another day. We've seen his promise and we've seen his mission. His mission was to come to die. That's why he came. But I also want to point to you his innocence. Before we get into the passage that speaks specifically to his innocence, I want to say this. Jesus didn't just physically suffer, like Mel Gibson's movie, very accurately portrays, you know he suffered spiritually for you too. 
The Apostle Paul wrote a letter to all the churches in the regions of Galatia. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, the Apostle Paul says this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. You ever done something that keeps you up at night? Have you ever done something that you knew in your heart was wrong and it really, really bugged you? I mean, you felt the weight of it. You felt the shame. Can you imagine? I would never do this, but can you imagine? If God came along and said, hey, I know, I know the weight of that, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take all Matt's weight and I'm going to put that on it too. I'm going to take Chad's. I'm going to let you feel that. Can you imagine having to feel the weight of somebody else's sin that you didn't commit? We can't hardly do it on our own sometimes. Can you imagine somebody else? Can you imagine the sin of the entire world? Every person, past, present, and future, every single sin that had already been committed, was being committed, and was ever going to be committed, was laid on a sinless person. Huh. That makes it even worse. Make it a little bit better if you blame the sin or the weight of the guilt of that on some Charles Manson type or some terrible person. But God took all that and he put it on the sinless Lamb of God. He took all of our ugliness. Look at chapter 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned, everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Paul preached this powerfully and passionately to the Corinthian church and he wrote them in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, one of my favorite New Testament passages. It says, For our sake God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Cool. That's powerful. In other words, there was a big trade-off there. And let me tell you, we wanted that trade. Martin Luther calls it the great exchange. He, he took all of our sin and laid it on him. He took all of his righteousness and he laid it on us. Whew. I'll take that every day. And I do. Now I want to wrap up with two questions this morning that I think we need to be very clear on the answer. Question number one. Who do we blame for the terrible injustice against an innocent Savior? Who's the blame? Who can we point the finger at here? Who is the blame? Because Jesus was absolutely innocent. He didn't deserve to be beat like that. He didn't deserve to die on the cross. Who do we blame? Well, some would say the creed says he suffered under Pontius Pilate. We can blame the Romans. After all, Pilate was the one that turned him over to be crucified. The Roman soldiers are the ones that flogged him with those sticks. They're the ones that pulled the hair out of his beard, spit in his face, drove the crown of nails deep into his head, or the crown of thorns deep into his head, drove the nails in his palm. Romans did that. We can blame them for the crucifixion. Wrong. <coughs> Some could say, well, it's the Jewish people. They're to blame. After all, John chapter 19, verse 14 says, Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. And Pilate said to the Jews, Behold your king. And they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Okay? We could say, The Jews... Are responsible for the crucifixion of Christ. Wrong again. You want to know who's responsible for the suffering and the death of the sinless Son of God? God is. Look at Isaiah 53, verse 10. After Isaiah lays all this out, all this terrible suffering, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. It was Yahweh's. The Father crushed the Son. 
The Father put him to great grief. Folks, all of this was part of the predetermined plan of God. It wasn't like God was up in heaven wringing his fingers. Oh my goodness, what are they going to do? My son, I can't believe they're treating that way. Why would my people reject him? Why would Pilate turn him over to be beaten and tortured and die on a cross? Oh, I need to intervene. That wasn't happening. Listen, Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. He stood up and he preached this powerful sermon. And right towards the end of the sermon, listen to what he says. He says, this man, he's talking about Jesus. This man, Jesus, was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him on the cross. Yeah, wicked men condemned Jesus. Wicked men tortured him and crucified him. But all of this was part of the definite plan of God. It was all part of his plan from the beginning. Now the last question you gotta ask, and I'll close with this. Why would a loving God do that? Why would a loving God put his son, his own son, through a terrible, horrible, terrible, terrible pain and suffering and death like this? The answer comes to us in the most famous passage in all the Bible. John 3:16 says. God so loved the world, he gave his only son. So that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. There's not a doubt in my mind that this was not an easy thing for the Father to watch. But I'm telling you, he did it. And he did it because he loves us. He did it to display how much he loves the world, how far he's willing to go that you would experience eternal life. I believe he suffered under Pontius Pilate. He submitted to the Father's plan. And he did it for me, he did it for you. He's fulfilling the promise that this plan would prosper. And folks, every believer that's here this morning, you are a living witness to the prosperity of that plan. We are living witnesses that it worked. But here's what I'll say before we pray. Every person who denies this gospel, every person who refuses to believe it, joins with those who said, I will have no Lord over me. Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. I want no part of that. This Lord is coming back. Our King is returning. And he says what he does, he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. And I'm telling you right now, you'll want to be with the sheep. You don't want to be a goat. The gospel will be the life of Gracious God, Lord, I love you so much. I thank you for the truth of the gospel. As Paul said, it is the power of God for salvation that everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the non jew Thank you for these gospel truths. And I thank you, Lord, that we can have our faith solidified even more in, in the preaching of the gospel. When we look back 700 years before and we see, Lord, this, this prophecy that was written, every line of it came to pass. Thank you, God, for this glorious truth. And I thank you for every believer that is here this morning. I thank you for every person who has submitted to the Lordship of Christ. They put their faith in the sacrificial death of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that they have been delivered from the curse of the law because you became a curse for us in our place. Lord, we, we don't experience the curse of the law because you've done that for us. We thank you. We thank you for that. And I pray for every believer here today, Lord, that we would walk in that truth and understand this in no way gives us license to sin against you. Lord, may we walk in grateful hearts, thankful, God, for the sacrifice. And Lord, I also want to pray for those that are here today or maybe listening online that are not a born-again believer. Lord, may they know that there is a very real wrath coming. And it will be poured out on the sons of disobedience it will be poured out on every person that refuses to acknowledge that Jesus is their king. And so I pray, Lord, 
earnestly praying this morning that your grace would be poured out in every unbelieving heart, that you do the work, break up any foul ground, and they hear the gospel, and the veil be pulled back this morning. May they who were in darkness see clearly. Do the work in their hearts that needs to be done right now. May they acknowledge their sinfulness. May they confess that you are the Son of God, that you died for them. May they be resurrected to new life this morning. As our heads are bowed, I want to pray for those people I just prayed for. If you're here this morning, you say, Steve, I have not been resurrected to new life. I know I am not a child of God. I do not believe heaven is my eternal home or my eternal destiny. I need that to change. If you want to acknowledge that this morning, I want to pray with you. I'm not going to ask you to join me up front, but I do want to know who you are. So if you're here this morning, you say, that's me. I know I am not a believer. I want to confess my sin and acknowledge Christ as King and Lord of my life. Quickly slip your hand up put it right back down so I know who I'm praying with. Is there anyone I can pray with right now? Anybody? Praise Jesus. Stay with me if you would. God, it is good to get gathered together with your people, and I thank you for a wonderful people that you have brought together in this church body. And Lord, as we leave here this week, I know many of us are going to go back to the busyness of our day, the busyness of our week. But Lord, I really did pray that you would move on each and every heart. May we find some extra time this week to go into the secret place of prayer, to take our Bibles with us, to, to study, to meditate on the passion of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ, that, that week leading up to your crucifixion, the crucifixion story. Lord, may we meditate on the wonderful free gift we have. When it's free for us and it was not free for you. You paid it all so that we wouldn't have to. Help us to walk in this truth, to meditate upon it. May it impact how we live, how we treat others. Gracious God, let your face shine upon this church and everybody here today. Thank you again for a wonderful time in worship. Be glorified in our lives. We ask this again in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. God bless you folks.